Um, I started out as a musician and producer uh, originally in the 80s. I made 20 records. I was a medium successful musician and then I, I got the internet bug in 1995 and I went on the internet and I started a company like Spotify uh, in 1997. And then after I did about 12 different companies in music and media in San Francisco, where I, th where I lived back then, uh, I realized that my problem was that I was always too early. I wasn't actually wrong, I was just too early. So the idea of Spotify obviously is a great idea. Some of you may be using the music service. You know, you know Spotify, right? Yeah. So, or, or YouTube, which was another one of my ideas in the 90s. Right? So being way too early has advantages, but I realized in 2001 after I went bankrupt by being too early, which is a great mark of distinction in America. Uh, if you don't go bankrupt, then you, you haven't lived. Right? <laughs> But I had 150 employees and $25 million of venture capital, and that all went away. And then in 2002, I wrote a book called The Future of Music, which was about the music business. Um, and basically outlined a strategy how uh, musicians and record labels and publishers and so could embrace the internet uh, to change how they do things. And that became a bestseller very quickly. Uh, I think basically a widely read but widely ignored bestseller. Um, and so after that, people started calling me and said, well, you're a futurist. And I'm like, I, I didn't know what a futurist was. You, you probably don't know what a futurist is. <laughs> right, so uh, in 2005, people started calling me to, to, talk, to talk about the future, first about music, then about films and television and publishing and tourism and energy and banking, right? And so I became a futurist. Uh, today, I run a company called the Futures Agency. And we do what the name says, we are kind of like agents for the future. So there's 25 of us and what we do is we help companies and governments and individuals and, and industry organizations to figure out what they're going to do five to seven years from, from today. Right. So this is referred to as immediate future. Right. It's basically about today, except for that we haven't noticed that it, it's really about today. Right. There's a great saying in China that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Right? And it's very true because most people who are more into uh, playfulness, like kids obviously are not interested in making money yet, right? until a certain age they just do things, right? then you observe. And when you observe things, you can see them pretty clearly if you take the time. Now we work with over 100 companies in telecommunications and marketing and advertising and brands, energy, uh, media and so on. And the biggest problem is that the most executives of those companies spend 99.9% .9 thinking about today and next week. Right? Next month, next quarter, okay? That's it. They don't have time. They don't have the brain space. Right? I've done quite a bit of work in Norway, including for Stat Oil and Skanska and many others. Right, where we have this thinking that the future is basically something you automatically get to. Right? But it's not. Right? The future is something that we, we design. Right? We determine that future. We, we try to discover it. So that's kind of what I do. Um, today we're uh, going to talk about the digital transformation of society and what it could mean for you. Uh, I'm not an architect or a builder or... Uh, in fact, I'm not an expert on your industry, as you'll find out very quickly. So what it means for you will be up for you to decide. I will uh, draw some conclusions, then we can discuss it. We have 90 minutes, so we can take questions right away. We're using an online system that is called Poll Everywhere. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you have to actually use it in this session, so you can take it out now and, and connect. Right? Because uh, we're going to communicate. You're welcome, of course, to ask a question in person. That is also possible still. Uh, thought transmission isn't uh, available yet. Uh, the website is futurediscussion.com. Okay? And the way it works is that this is just a, a shortcut. You know, it's, a, it's a web address that you can use. Uh, while I'm speaking, you can use the current page, which is a question page. You can just ask anything you want or comment. Okay? Please don't cut and paste a bunch of stuff, just very short, right? Like telegraph style, okay? Um, and we can take a look at this later. I'll explain how the polls will work. So uh, that works pretty much on any mobile phone. Uh, we're going to do some polling, some live voting, 
the voting is basically yes, no, maybe kind of vote. You can do that also with a dumb phone, with SMS. I doubt you have one, but you know, who knows? All right, so um, basically um, you can download the slides later tonight. I'm going to put them up when I get to the airport at futuristgert.com. That's my web page. Um, and just look for the heading where it says uh, Oslo, and I'll put them up tonight. So the very important thing about the future is this. Right? You will never design your future if you don't feel pain. That's the German part of me speaking. And if you feel love, that's the American part. I, I lived in America for 17 years. I was born in Germany. I live in Switzerland now, a neutral country. Basically what happens is that if you're looking at your profession, sometimes it's very helpful to consider what could go wrong. For example, I worked with all the CEOs of the major car companies in Germany five years ago. And we started a discussion about electric cars, self-driving cars, self-parking cars, connected cars. And they said five years ago that an electric car, was no, nobody wants one. And the idea of sharing a car is a crazy idea, right? Only kids would do this that don't have a car. Right? Today, what are the key trends in, in the... Well, not so much in Norway because of your territorial outline. Right? You need a car to go out into the country. But in most Western countries, the key trends are for kids not to have a driver's license, trend number one. Right? Kids that live in cities don't have a driver's license. It's declining. Sharing a car, Ubering, you know, taking the Uber transport. If you buy a car, you buy a hybrid or an electric. Right? It's only people like us who like big, fat cars, like German cars. Right? The trend is quite clear, so it would have been good for the car companies to see the pain coming. Right? You know what the pain is today? Tesla, you know the Tesla car, the electric car, sells five times as many cars in America than BMW and Mercedes combined in the luxury class. Right? And that happened in two years. So talk about pain, right? So when I say a few things and you feel pain, pain coming, this is a good thing, right? Because if we don't feel pain, we don't change. On the other hand, pain isn't a very good motivator to actually change anything because it just drives you to feel depressed or start drinking or God knows what, right? We also have to have new ideas. So I'm going to give you both the idea of what could go wrong and what's coming, what could be difficult, and also what's exciting. So in the end, you know, basically the motivation to change is a combination of the two. Uh, today's about discovery about your discovery, not about my commandments, uh, not about my recipes. And, you know, obviously I'm not an expert in Norway, even though I've been to Norway many times for the last 30 years, really. You are the experts in Norway. So we have to make a synthesis of those two things. So have you gotten on? Yeah, it's working? Okay. I will change this page right now. It looks like this. Let's see, in theory, it looks like this. This is what you should see. Okay, it works on the smartphone. As soon as we do the poll, this page, this page will change, and you can do your voting. Right now, you can ask any question you want, and I can see them here. Let's see if you have asked any questions yet. I don't think so. We'll go back to that in a second. All right, so that's, that's how it works, and you can use it any time you want. So basically, what we're seeing now is what I, what's been referred to as digital transformation, going from an analog society, you know, a world of <coughs> products, services, large companies, monopolies of media and so on and so on, to a, company, to a world that's completely connected. Right now there's 3.1 billion people on the internet. In 2020 it'll be 6 billion, 70% of the population. You can only imagine what will happen at that point right, in regards to how we consume media how we're going to invest, how we vote. Everything completely networked and digital. There's many good things about that, of course, and many difficult things like privacy or addiction. For example, language will go away as a barrier. You're probably aware that the times of Google Translate, you know, they are long gone. Now we have intelligent apps like Say Hi or Skype starting December. Starting this month, you can do a phone call on Skype in Norwegian, and it comes out in Chinese in real time. 
Say hi as an app. It's a $2 app I use all the time. You can speak into the app in German and talk to the Japanese waiter about what you want to order. It comes out Japanese in real time and the other way around. 99% accurate. So imagine what that will do for communication. I mean, the, you remember the scene from, from Star Trek, you know, the, the movie, 30 years ago, where you can speak and it comes out in any gibberish language from some other planet, right? It'll be exactly like this. In fact, my kids who are uh, 20 and 25, they have already argued that they should not learn languages because they can just speak into an app. Right? And so they can have a relationship with a Chinese girl speaking English or German, it doesn't matter, right? It's a very strange thought. But anyway, we have this transformation, right? So big transformation is that data is now running everything, right? Data is the primary driver of the economy now. It's not oil, which is not so good for Norway, right? We're switching from oil to data. The future is all about data. The big companies today, they deal with data. Google, Facebook, right? Alibaba. Banking is data. Money is data. Information is data. Building plans are data. Right? It's all about data. Has been referred to as big data. I'm sure you've heard the word. Right? It's sort of the next big thing after social media, whatever that is. Right? But big data and then, of course, the possibility of the Internet of Things which is basically the internet for devices, for traffic lights, for pipelines, for, for trucks, for wristwatches. Uh, there are some estimates saying that by 2020 we'll have over 200 billion devices networked. Every traffic light, every house, every parcel, every apple in the store. And all you know, the internet of things, tracking our movements, sharing, you have wearable computing outfits. And, and of course, what we have here is what has been referred to by many people as the third industrial revolution. This is about information. It's about sustainability. It's about new forms of energy. There's a whole book on this by Jeremy Rifkin called The Third Industrial Revolution. So it's a shift away from the using of energy and just uh, using it and depleting it to a circular, a circular economy. I'll talk more about that later, but those are the key threats. So the scary part today is that we are witnessing exponential growth <coughs> of everything. So linear means we're counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Exponential means we're counting 1, 2, 4, 8, 13, 32, 16, 32, 64. So we're exponentially progressing. And the funny part is when you count 1, 2, 3, that's almost the same than 1, 2, 4. Doesn't make much of a difference. But then you go from 4 to 8, not from 4 to 5. And, and we're at this point here. Right? We're, we're at this takeoff point. All the stuff we see today that sounds like science fiction right, is becoming true. If you look at the leading movies, Minority Report, uh, Blade Runner, all the science fiction, a lot of the stuff in that movie, like the movie Her, you've seen the movie Her? Right, where you fall in love with your operating system? You have to watch this, very interesting. Um, they're becoming true. For example, uh, language translation, right? This is Google Translate here. It sucked. Right? Didn't do anything, especially not for Norwegian. Right? For any, or Finnish, try Finnish. Right? And a lot of times it sucked. People would have a, a good joke about this. Or Siri, you know, your voice control on the iPhone. Didn't do anything. Now it's basically at this point to where that stuff is coming so smart, it's becoming consumer ready. The same goes for many things like 3D printing. Yeah, I can 3D print my iPhone cover. Very soon I can 3D print my Nike shoe. I can 3D print my ice cream on the beach. There's no jokes on that one. Ice cream is actually very simple. Unilever is looking at this. You know they're selling 350 million Magnum ice creams a year? You know Magnum, the ice cream? Now they're going to put a machine on the beach that you can print your own with your name on it. Same idea. And that is sort of taken off. Or other ideas like, for example, augmenting what we can do as, as people. Right? You have people who are disabled to have a cochlear implant to hear. You've seen that, right? right? The same thing will happen with Wikipedia. And I'm not joking. Right? You can implant knowledge and data. Right? As soon as you have brain-computer interfaces. These things are all happening. Right? Bioengineering, 
of, of uh, genes, so we don't have to take a cholesterol pill, we'll engineer the genes. Right? That's about 10 years away. So a lot of that stuff will impact what you do, and it's basically creating a new interface between people and technology. And in building and construction, of course, this is a key thing, for example, modeling. Right? All of a sudden, you can model in a whole different way. You can simulate. IKEA in Sweden already has an app that's augmented reality. You may have seen this. You can take out the catalog, and then you can picture what the furniture would look like in your room. So you use the catalog, and then you hold up your mobile phone, and it projects the furniture into, into your room. So you can imagine what it would, and you know, the cells are increasing, of course. So. Robotics. For a long time, that was like a good robot would be a million euros. And now robots are becoming so cheap. The cheapest one is called Baxter, $27,000. And you can teach Baxter to take your grandmother out of the bathtub, right? and it's safe. Millions of them already ordered. Right? They can't make them as fast as, as people want them. So look at those lines of robotics. That's a scary thought when robots get to be intelligent. Like, you know, Google car, the Google self-driving car. You've seen this, right? I wrote in it the other day. It's very scary because this car is essentially a robot. You're driving inside of a robot. And so all kinds of things could happen, including the robot gets hacked, so it kills you. Right? Or it doesn't let you out. Or it doesn't drive because it's frozen would be a possibility here, right? Or it doesn't get the cloud, the internet. So we have a bunch of laws that will be very important for you in the building business. First of one is Moore's Law, which I'm sure you've heard of. Right? The power of technology doubles every 18 months. What that means is the cost of computing goes down like minus zero. I mean, the power I have here on this iPhone, right? this is the same power as like 25 of the biggest mainframe IBM computer 20 years ago. And look where this curve is going. Right? Computing cost, zero. You want to render a building in 3D printing 10 years ago when it taken you four days and a bunch of processes. Today, you know, in the future, it'll be like flushing the toilet. <coughs> Push a button, boom. Mind-boggling what happens there. Metcalfe's law, which is the utility of network is proportional to the numbers of users. You guys are on LinkedIn? That's Metcalfe's law. LinkedIn, 370 million people. If you want to reach anyone, you can find it through LinkedIn. You want to look, you're looking for a new job? You get that through LinkedIn. It's the biggest human resources network in the world. Last year, LinkedIn made $850 million with something that didn't even exist two years ago, which is the network. So one of the first points is to remember if you want to be successful in the future in your business, uh, whatever part of building, construction, architecture that may be, it's about the network effect. You have to be part of a network effect. Also in learning. Because the scope is just so much higher. You know? Why is Facebook so powerful? You guys are still on Facebook? You know? Everybody wants to leave, but we're still there. <laughs> Facebook is powerful because it's so big. Right? The network effect is mind-boggling. It's just, it's very powerful. This is why other networks like Allo and other social networks, you know, when there's, I don't know, two million people, well, there's no network effect. And for a small country, the network effect is even more important because right? it allows you to connect to international audiences. The third one is Ray Kurzweil, who is the founder of the Singularity Movement. Quite a crazy character, brilliantly crazy in a way. He's the guy who's talking about how humans and machines will converge by 2029. It's called the singularity. This is also very important for you because it's talking about how machines are impacting everything. And he has the law of accelerating returns. That means when you put this all together, which I'll show you another slide, it's basically accelerating in a wildly exponential way. So when everything is ready, it just goes boom and it's gone. It takes, takes off like a firecracker. So, it's basically things coming together and accelerating together. Another way of looking at this curve is to say, okay, uh, humans really are developing linearly. Now, we cannot be exponential. We don't have the capacity. 
There's a lot of research on this. You now we can have 150 friends in our tribe. That's basically it's always been like this. We can't have 15,000. Right? So LinkedIn or Facebook or Zing or whatever you're using, you cannot have 15,000 friends. You just don't have the space. You can improve a little bit by using smart tools. Right? That's like this. You can learn how to live with social media or mobile. You can be more efficient. Yeah, you can do all those things, but you'll never be this. That is because we're not machines. Yeah? We, we are not capable of keeping, keeping information like this. And we don't decide like machines do. We decide purely on an emotional basis. 98% of it is not based on facts. Yeah? That is a good thing. But here in this, in this box, you have the difference between linear thinking and exponential thinking, that's where all of the dis disruption happens. That's where startups start. For example, eBay said, oh, you know, we're, we're, we can make this exponential if we put all the stuff that people want to sell online. Right? And that's exponential. And Airbnb, right? you guys know Airbnb? Fantastic service for renting apartments, or if you have an apartment for renting it out. These are the Airbnb locations in Oslo. I use it all the time. Sometimes a total disaster, sometimes really good. Hard to say, really, where that will go. I'm experimenting. But Airbnb says, if you have something that's available for renting, 62% of places in most cities are left empty. 62%. And some places like London, it's like 80%. I think it's a lot less here. But Then you can offer it to rent to people who are qualified through the system. It's like having your own private hotel, in a way. Right? And so what Airbnb is doing, they're using the difference between linear economics, which is basically humans, right, and exponential technology, which is a database, right, basically. They don't own any buildings. They don't build anything. They don't control people. They do nothing except for the database and facilitating. So if you can think of a business model like this, Airbnb is now twice valued as twice as much as the Hyatt hotel chain. Right? This is a startup. It's worth twice as much as the Hyatt hotel chain in 18 months. So if you can think of something exponential to do, you know, that would be quite useful, uh, at least if you want to be valued at that kind of range. And then we have this phenomenon, which is very interesting around the world. This is a great opportunity for Oslo, in my view. Uh, is, is the rise of cities as the leaders of transformation. Because the problem is that most governments don't agree how they should be doing this among the political situation. Right? And cities are like micro, microcosms. So you can actually figure out local economy support, you can figure out how to use technology. New York City now has a chief digital officer. The woman is 24 years old. Right? Is a native, not a politician. Every major city around the world brings in digital natives to run these kind of initiatives. Rio de Janeiro is gearing up to be one of the places with the most connected services through smartphones and apps. You wouldn't believe it because, you know, it's Brazil, right? But people do use that. It's mind-boggling also how you see how many cities we will have in the future, mega cities. Urbanization is a big thing, you know, not so much in Norway maybe, but around the world it is. Right? Great example, Rio de Janeiro, becoming a smart city. Copenhagen, of course, has always boosted, not, not just for the standard of living, but also for the transportational issues, for all the other things. Helsinki, right, what they're trying with the transportation system. So clearly, to take initiative on a, on a city level is, is right here. Right? It's something you could do tomorrow to figure out how to change the way that you do things together. So now you look at this rather confusing chart, and you can look at it later when you download the PDF. But all these things are basically your future. So you should spend some time looking at what they mean. And it's, it's sort of geeky territory, obviously. But, I mean, let's start at the very top, you know. Clearly the fact that people use social and mobile devices uh, makes it easier for them to investigate purchases. For example, there's, there's like a hundred apps for real estate. Like one is called Zillow. It's used widely in the US. You drive down the street and you hold up the mobile phone and it will show you with augmented reality the data of the house you're looking at and how much it's worth and how much you, the mortgage would be. And you can hit a button 
and request to buy it. This is using all public information. Right? And you can, you can look at your own house every day and drive by and say, oh, it's worth $50 or more. Right? And they're using stuff like demographics and crime statistics and everything. That relates to big data analytics. 3D printing will be a big thing because people are you know, now looking already in China, you can 3D print a house, you know, a very ugly house, of course, like a dog house, you know, sort of, like a big one. All of these things, renewable energy, the Internet of Things, robotics. Right? And then over here, you see these accelerators over here, you see the consequences, right? Uh, smart homes, the connected car, the smart grid, smart cities, all these things will impact construction. So I would say if you're in the uh, business of architecture and building, you're basically in the technology business. Right? I mean, you're in, the, you're in the design business, of course, right? And that's the good thing, because it's not all going to be about technology. Right? It's going to be about humanity. But still, all of these things are becoming important. Will people have autonomous vehicles? I think in most cases they will, but not one that will drive freely out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, many people have looked at these issues, for example, with a self-driving car. It is almost impossible to duplicate a human driving a car in free-flowing traffic. Because the decisions that we make that take a split of a second will take the car a year to crunch on. For example, if you are, I looked at a case study the other day where the self-driving car is going down the street and then there's a frog on the street and there's a double yellow line and the frog sits there and clearly the car would have to decide, do they kill the frog? They try to run around, the, uh, go across you know, one wheel left or right or cross the double yellow line because there's no traffic. The car cannot make that decision. It's forbidden to cross a double yellow line, cannot harm the frog, cannot take the risk of killing the frog accidentally by going around it. So it will stop and wait. Right? You know how long it takes us to figure this out? Like one thousandth of a second. We'll kill the frog. No, just kidding. No. <laughs> we'll do, you know, if there's no traffic, we, of course we avoid it, right, if we can. But those are things that will take a long time for a computer to figure out. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on here except for numbers and laws. So if we allow the car to make its own decision, that would be very bad. You know what would happen. As the car gets smarter because it's connected, it would eventually say, you know what, you're not driving anymore. Because clearly I'm a, I'm a worse driver than, than the self-driving car. Computer can drive us better. A pilot that is automated will fly us better in the future than a real pilot. There's a social problem there that we wouldn't feel happy driving, you know, flying in a robot, basically. But it's pretty much a fact. So basically what happens here is uh, this world is highly combinatorial. This is keyword number one. So in this world, you cannot exist in your own uh, realm of planning. Right? You have to look at all the other factors. What will people want in a few years? Do they want bigger houses, smaller houses? Will they be connected? Will they, will, work, will they work on telepresence? Will they work in an office? Will they travel much? So these questions are basically requiring us to reset how we think about what we do. Lucky enough, of course, for builders in, in your business, people will actually live there. It's not like when you're in the newspaper business or the music business or, or, or television, right? People don't actually own the music or the, or the news. Right? They just watch it and then it's gone. Anything physical becomes worth more. Anything digital becomes commodity. So in a way, there's a great word for this that just emerged in the last few months that I've started riffing off, and that is called hell then. Okay, you can imagine what it means, hell and heaven. Depends how you look at it. This could be fantastic or it could be a total disaster. I mean, imagine the fact that everything is connected, everything is known about you, you have no privacy left, you know, all your information is shared with your insurance companies and the government and the NSA and the police and God knows who, right? and Google runs your life, that will be hell. Right? On the other side of the equation, it's quite clear that if we use technology, for example, in the right way and we connect appliances, devices, thermostat, heating systems, air conditions, we can solve climate change. 
because we can make basically the entire city set up 50% more efficient, at least 50%. In Los Angeles, they just connected all the traffic lights last year, 4,700 traffic lights in the center, right? and now the average saving is 12% of gas by synchronizing the traffic lights based on traffic situation. So if you think this story, for example, logistics, <coughs> delivering goods, if it's all connected, we can save substantial amount of money. And then if we switch to renewable energy, we can solve that problem in the long run, you know, 20 years. Yes, we can. And we can invent, of course, a lot more things. So that's kind of heaven. Right? This rather confusing chart shows you all the things that are happening with exponential developments. So it's kind of like what we're seeing here, and this is what I want to start with, is, is the fact that we're looking at exponential technology means you have, to ex you have to have exponential innovation. You cannot have linear innovation. Right in Switzerland, where I live now, the primary attitude to innovation is wait and see. Right? I mean, they could innovate whatever they want, and they're basically saying that at this point they prefer to observe and look for a proven case and then copy it or just jump in with lots of money, like they did in banking. When you do that in this kind of uh, environment, when you do that here, it's fine because you can observe, right? But when you do it in an environment that takes off quickly, that's basically sort of wait and die. Because by the time it's taken off, it's too late for you to be part of it. So that's really becoming a very important. There's a term for this that the military is using. It's called VUCA. Right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And that's our future. That's not going to change anytime soon. We have to face a reality that in this world where everything is connected, we're going to have more chaos, more complexity, more speed, more ambiguity, more uncertainty. We're not going to go back and, and say, well, you know, in this case, we have to think about what, how we can respond to this. Right? But this is kind of going, this is going to be our default surrounding in terms of our... What? Sometimes you'll be alerted to incidents on the... Let's get rid of that for a second. So, as an example, the fast erosion of incumbent providers, you know, uh, service providers who have been around for a long time. I'm not going to talk about the record labels or the TV companies or the publishers because it's obvious. I mean, if you, if you have a bookstore today, you want to get out as quickly as possible. Right? You know, a bookstore, I mean, people are going to switch to e-books. What do you want with a bookstore? A radio station, you know, people have podcasts and, and stream over the network. This example here is Google Maps and an app called Google Field Trip. And Google has 10 such apps that completely replace navigation. If you use Google Maps, I mean, you're using Google Maps to get around, right? You use Google Field Trip, you use Google Glass if you want, yeah, or Google Goggles or whatever else they have, right? You can navigate anywhere in any language in real time. Well, guess what happens to companies like TomTom, Tom, right? Do you know TomTom, Tom, those things you stick to your windshield? Gone. Right? And <laughs> why do you buy a TomTom Tom device? I mean, it has better GPS, okay? That is the only reason. And now every car is connected to the internet. TomTom Tom is, is gone. Garmin, toast. Right? I mean, at least in this part of their business. So basically, this erosions of incumbents, and this is very true for construction, for example, or banks. All of a sudden, people do different things. For example, now you have in Africa, you have a service called M-Pesa, which is mobile money. It's 58% of all money in Africa is sent through the mobile phone using M-Pesa, not the bank. That's, we don't need that here because we have banks and we have cards, right? But in Africa, you have unbanked. So the, the banks are looking at this saying that it could very well be that in three to four years, 30% of our money is going to go to mobile platforms like WhatsApp. You guys use WhatsApp? Everybody's using WhatsApp. You know the messenger? No? no? Viber? You know, it's a messaging service. It's free on the network. Uh, 800 million users. Or Gmail, you know. Google wants you to send money through Gmail. So you have somebody... You have one a family member studying in Mozambique, you can send the money instantly through Gmail. Right? Cost you, what, 40 euros 
to send it to the bank here. So this is erosion that we're seeing here pretty much all the way around. Now, as, as another example, and this, is, this could be a lesson for you if you are in that business of uh, being digitally contestable. That means somebody can invent something to change the way that you're doing business and you haven't thought of it. Airbnb is one of those examples, or Uber. Right? Airbnb is one of those examples where you say, well, the hotels could have thought of that. Or Flipboard, or you know, for publishers, or the iPad, for that matter, or the iPhone, whatever. Right? But here, you have, for example, the movie business, where I worked for a long time. The movie business, the major TV studios, made 64% of their money on selling DVDs. And the rest was movie theaters and streaming and television. Well, guess what's happening now? And you see this. Do you still buy DVDs? Anybody buy DVDs? If I give my kids a DVD for Christmas, they're going to take me to the therapist, right? <laughs> I think, I, no, literally, I tried it. Right? I think, what in the world are you thinking? Right? Plastic. Everybody knows music and television is a click on something whether it's in an online service or, I mean, you're probably doing this on a smart television, on the iPad. And when you get Netflix, you have Netflix here, right? Little Hummer, right? Great show. We're watching that. But uh, when you have Netflix, the price of watching a movie, how much is the price of watching a movie? Is zero. You pay 10 euros or whatever you pay here, 100 kroners a month, 120, I think, right? It used to be, what, 300 kroners for a DVD, for one DVD. And now you pay 120 for, what, 16 million movies. Talk about disruption. So if your business is contestable with digital technology, you have to do something. That's the first question you should ask yourself. What part of my business can be contested by software, right? by intelligent machines, by smart technology? And the first process, of course, is you know, pre-building the planning, the modeling, all that stuff, the data that goes into that, the, the simulation of what it would look like, right? that is going to be completely contested. And it's like, I, know, I looked at this uh, two days ago, it's like 850 startups in building modeling technology, funded startups. And you know what comes after that is then the part of actually building, right? or a part of getting permits, the part of environmental impact research, all that stuff, right? using technology becomes software. We'll skip this because you don't know it very well. So what, hap what happens here, and this is a good overall sign, is that basically this, uh, the world of online and offline are converging. There's no difference. Basically, in a couple of years, and this is already quite true in Norway because you're highly networked with a fast network that we don't have in most countries, it, you don't even know that you're online or offline. It's a mental state to be offline. I mean, I, I was in Tanzania three months ago with my younger son, the first time in his life when he could not connect to the Internet. He was sitting there trying to play music, music on YouTube, saying, what is going on here? It's not working. I'm saying, well, we don't have a network. You know? You're not connected. You can't play music without being connected. First time you ever realized this. It's like going to the bathroom. There's no water, you know. It's like... And that's quite common in Africa also. Right? So online and offline is the same thing now. It's like becoming like air. In Finland, you can sue the government if you don't have internet, right? <laughs> it's a civil right. Humans and machines. This is the scary part. When you think about that, these things are already our external brains. They're functioning like my brain. But the phone numbers of my mother, my wife, my kids, I know those by heart, yeah? But everybody else, it's in here. My, my calendar, it's in here. If I want to quote you some interesting statistics, it's also in here, right? temporarily in here. Maps. This is our external brain. Products and services. Things that used to be products are now services. Television, for example, used to be a box. Now it's what? An app. Now it's a software. Right? Cars are, used to be product, now cars are services. I mean, it's not really true for us here you know, in many ways, but if you live in a major city around the world, 
transportation as a service. Right? It's not something you own. You may own it or share it, but it's moving to be a service. BMW is looking at this whole model of saying, well, if we in the future had cities like Singapore and Beijing buying 100,000 self-driving cars, that is a service business, right? Because they're leasing those cars, but the main part of the car is not the car, it's the operating system. It's the technology. So if you sell products, you, you have to think about whether you can make them services. And the tough part is that you can sell them for less. A DVD, 30 euros. Netflix, 10 euros a month. Then we used to have the internet, which is connecting us, basically. Email, web pages, and so on, connecting computers. Now we have the internet of things. Connecting traffic lights, environmental sensors, logistics, devices, wristwatches, whatever. And uh, there are some people saying that roughly in, uh, in 10 to 15 years we'll probably have 100 trillion connected devices. I mean, it's a crazy idea, eh? But that's where it's going. So we're heading towards total digitization. I don't mean this in a positive way. I mean this rather as a statement, right? It's not necessarily all a good thing, right? But this is basically what technology is doing because it's becoming so cheap. The networked home, I mean, you guys know, of course, this is, this is becoming reality. This is just a cultural question of whether we like this or not. And there's vast differences. In Korea, you have electronic pets. Right? In Japan, 1.5 million people have an electronic dog. I'm not joking. Right? It comes up and it barks. You can teach them how to bark. You, you know. Japan, right? So this and you know, everything is becoming technology. Everything is becoming networked, digitized. And it's driven by this. It's all driven by this. Right? The more systems know about us, the more they can do for us, and the more we become sort of obvious or transparent to the system. And in many cities, this is becoming a major issue. If you have data about people, you can do different services, you can do different product development, you can decide on what to do first. I mean, smart cities are using that system of big data and connectivity to drive efficiency. Business intelligence. I mean, it's hard to believe that until 10 years ago, most cities or governments didn't actually know much about people. They knew sort of the telecom companies knew who we call and those kind of things, right? But they don't do anything with it. Now Google has perfected this. Google knows more about you than your husband or your wife. That's not a joke, because it's true. Think about that for a second. Seven years of Google, Gmail, location, mobile phone. Google has all the information, and Google knows every bit that you've ever Googled. So whatever you've Googled about, you know, uh, costs of getting a divorce or whatever, you know, that Google knows all that about you. Right? It's extremely intelligent. This is why also why it's so dangerous, because right? it can do stuff with that information. So what happens here in this big data environment, if you're looking at building and construction, right, you can use that data and make sense out of it. That's like, it's like being on a jet plane compared to a bicycle, because right? the stuff you can learn from this. The algorithm that the FBI is using for Google and Facebook to figure out if I'm a threat right, is programmed to take all public information about me and subpoena information from Google, which they can get you know, pretty much any time of the day, unlike here. Right. They can put together a profile that says with 97% certainty what kind of food I like, what kind of sexuality, what kind of books, what kind of opinion, 97% likelihood. And they can, they can predict if I'm going to go to a demonstration or not. So if you look at this from the positive side, you can say if you use this data, for example, to figure out where you should build the house or how you should build it, or what other considerations people have. One person can do the job of 500 10 years ago using technology. And there's lots of, you know, for example, uh, uh, sentiment analysis, social media discovery, brand recognition, you know, 
Those kind of things you can figure out using technology. It's very powerful stuff. Cloud-based intelligence. You've seen the Volvo that parks itself. This is only, it's actually working now. Uh, so that's, I think it's the V40. Uh, where you can get out and it will find its own parking spot around 100 meters around you, without you. You use an app to control it. You don't drive it, you just get out and it will park itself. This is one of those self-driving car things that becomes reality very soon. Because in, in a big city where you have parking problems and you're in a hurry to go to a meeting, you just get out and the car finds its own slot because it knows everything about you. And then you can have it come to you when you're leaving. That's called cloud-based intelligence. Because the cloud provides information. Like, you know, for example, this company Belkin, they used to make cables. Now they make apps that connect your home equipment, heaters and refrigerators, to the internet. So you can control it and, and, and analyze it. 40% efficiency saving if you do this. So basically the world, I left out the last one on this convergence thing. Physical and digital is converging. You're just getting a new uh, 100 krona bill, right? I heard being redesigned at this very moment. Looks very uh, digital already. <laughs> but basically what we see here is quite clear, money is going to be digital. And this is a fantastic opportunity for a lot of reasons, of course. It's not just Bitcoin, you know, which unlikely will be that format, but digital money you know, reduces transaction costs, brings transparency, has significant privacy problems, of course, <laughs> that you can be tracked. But this will have a big, uh, big impact on how people transact, what they do, what they look at, and so on. So essentially, you're looking at this kind of giant wave. right? You guys are over here in the business of building things and designing things. And we have this giant wave of technology-driven innovations that, that are changing our culture. In some ways, you could say that you know, technology changes us. For example, in, uh, in Switzerland, where I live, you know, we are reluctant, for example, to give up on printed, on printed materials like newspapers. So Swiss people have enough money to have both. You know, they have the smartphone and the tablet and they subscribe and read the paper. In Spain, 74% of people under 30 don't read physical newspapers because they can save a euro. Right? And the same in the US, right? So this giant wave will have impact. Mobile services, social machine to machine communications, big data, artificial intelligence, which I'll talk about, and robotics. So if you want to know about your future, you should look at those topics because they're going to impact vastly pretty much everything, how people live, if and how they work. You could argue that probably in 15 to 20 years we don't have to work. It's quite, un it's quite likely because machines will do 80% of the work. That will have uh, significant social consequences, of course. We have more free time. Uh, and there's lots of discussions, as you know, about the guaranteed minimum income that relates to this whole debate about how people should get paid. So Mark Andreessen said this about 12 years ago. He said, uh, software is eating the world. In other words, everything is becoming software. And of course, you know, many of the services you're using are software. Right? So you know what I'm talking about. Television is now the cloud. So if you're 25, you don't use the television, you use YouTube, you use Hulu, Netflix, BitTorrent, whatever. And you click a button and off it goes. Books. Amazon sells three times as many e-books than it sells in print now. Most authors like myself that write business books, I've switched to digital, no more print. I still print them if you, if you absolutely have to have them, right? but they're more expensive now. That changes the entire economics. And here's, here's me with my first car. Uh, we've discussed earlier the, from the Ferrari. That's not me, I'm just kidding. Uh, I look much better than that. So here's the Ferrari, and then you know, now you have car sharing services. Again, it's a cultural question of whether people do that. It's, I hear it's not very popular here, but in general, this is kind of a trend. And so we have this overlap between humans and machines. That is clearly part of this whole story. I mean, not just machines as robots, but smart software. 
intelligent agents. I don't know if you've tried, uh, if you have an iPhone Siri, which is part of the iPhone, or Cortana, which is uh, part of uh, Microsoft solution, um, that essentially, if you use Siri now, you can drive in the car and you can say, call XYZ and make a reservation for 7 o'clock. Right? And it will do that for you. And then you can do more complex things very soon. For example, calculate you know, how, how much money I could pay for a mortgage in this part that I'm driving through right now. It will do that for you. So what we have is overlap of human and machines, you know, creating a, a really interesting scenario. You know, there's us, you know, rather complex situation with many things that are not expressed, that are not implicit, explicit, right? They're between the lines. And then there's machines emulating software, right? It's emulating what we do. And there, there's this, com this uh, conflict that's called the um, Moravec paradox. And basically what that means is, is that anything that's really easy for a machine, like crunching numbers and remembering lots of things, is almost impossible for humans. For example, doctors are now getting the IBM Watson, which is a huge machine. And the Watson, it's put into a small box connected to the cloud and goes right next to the doctor in hospital rounds when he makes his rounds. And this is a robot that goes on wheels. The doctor takes it along. And this robot can find 156,000 cases of the cancer that the patient has while he's at bed, in, the, in bed, right? While he's there visiting. And the doctor can bring up those graphs and compare and stuff, right? That would be impossible for a doctor. The doctor can remember two cases if he's lucky. So that, that is changing. And the other way around, anything that's really easy for us, like, you know, looking at somebody and saying, oh, God, this guy is an idiot, right? Or getting some sort of vibration or, you know, takes two seconds. Literally takes two seconds. Computer, never. Computer doesn't understand the joke. The simple joke, the simple frog decision, computer can't do. So that is the, the Moravec uh, paradox. So what that means in the future, the future of your business is going to be about using technology as much as deeply as you can, but emphasizing the human part, which a computer can never copy. So it's kind of a paradox in a way that technology has taken over, for example, reducing jobs. I mean, if you're a bookkeeper today, you may know some bookkeepers, right? Your job is toast in the future. Right? You know why? Because basically, smart software can figure all that stuff out. It's rules-based business, right? So you say, you give my text receipt, goes into this folder, and my currency differences, and so the computer does it. There's a company called Zing, X, Y, no, not Zing, uh, Zero, X, E, R, O, from New Zealand, that has invented a software that automates the entire bookkeeping process. Their goal is to make 20 million bookkeepers unemployed. I mean, the bookkeepers will start using that software right, to stay in business. <laughs> but that's basically what's happening here. Right? So here's an important statement, I think, for the general context of your future. Machines are for answers, and you have to use them for those answers. Humans are for questions. And this is when you talk to clients, right? This is not about necessarily giving them answers, but about asking the right questions. Now, that is the human part, because basically what happens here is you can clearly see all of the big internet companies, all they're investing in right now is two big topics, big data and artificial intelligence. To create very complex systems that answer very complex questions. But based on algorithms, right? the rise of the robots. Right? Because then we also have this, right? I mean, we are here now in a situation, as I showed in the exponential takeoff, the way that we, use, that we process information is very antiquated. You know, we, we go here and, you know, and we fetch information. Well, that's kind of very dull, and the interface is very bad. As I said before, in a conversation, it takes you five seconds to convey a thousand times as much information. Now, what we see in the future is holographic information that we can project. That's already working too expensive. This is now coming mainstream. In five years, no more typing. You only type because you want to convey certain kinds of things that you don't want to speak. Right? That's already working if you use the Google Chrome browser. On the, you, know, you, can, you can dictate emails. I started switching. I write all my books now with a voice-to-speech, I mean speech-to-text 
software called Dragon. I've improved the speed 10 times. Unfortunately, not the quality of my books, just the speech. But, but uh, this is becoming a standard interface now. So the future holds, you know, again, when you're looking at a, a plan for a building, you say, change this door to go three levels higher. And yeah, we'll do that. You don't have to move the mouse. You don't have to speak. You don't, you don't have to type. I saw a demo from a Sony uh, television uh, a provider in, uh, in Japan four weeks ago where you can sit down and you can say, play Lillehammer episode four where he uh, gets a flat tire, right? And it will just pull that up and play it for you. Imagine the difference that will make for you uh, also when you can do it in several languages. Screens everywhere. This is already the, our reality. We're moving to what's called a, a, screening, a screen society, screenification. Everything is a screen. So information is a screen, planning is a screen. Um, everything is done on screens, whether it's Google Glass or regular screens. Doctors, for example, are now starting to use Google Glass, which is a, a frame that allows you to access the Internet on the right side of your, of your eye, and you control it. So as you're doing the operation, you can see the data of the patient. You don't have to go look anywhere else. Uh, firefighters are using this to see the building plan when they go inside with a fire. And put, every policeman in the world wants to have this. I mean, I think it's actually illegal in Norway. But um, imagine a policeman pulling you over and recognizing your face with face recognition software uh, in such a device and pulling up all of your data, including your social network, your Google tracking, where you've been yesterday, prior convictions, likes, unlikes, tweets, whatever. That's, of course, what they want. So screenifying everything. At the same time, as you know, we have technology fatigue. Right? This is also very interesting. For example, this is a cartoon saying how we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving in the future. Uh, or any you know, Christmas, we're not going to see anybody. Everybody will virtually present through the iPad. <laughs> well, at least you won't have to really cook anything, right? And then, of course, uh, people are realizing, yeah, we weren't downloaded, we were born. Right? And this is also becoming a key trend, right? Especially people my age, of course. <laughs> I don't think a 15-year-old would care. You know, they would be surprised to, to know that they were actually born. Um, but this is a key trend also. I think what this means, for example, for building and for architecture is that the human part of what we want is going to increase. At the same time, the fact that we're relying on technology is not going to get any less, I don't think. I think it's a trend for people to disconnect. For example, in Switzerland, we have places where you pay extra because the internet isn't working. Right? And we have hotels that block the mobile network. You know, they are twice as expensive as the others. Right? So you can disconnect. You know? So offline is the new luxury, you could say. Right? It's a luxury business to go offline. And I think that that means a lot for homes and for vacation and those kind of things, but it's not going to be a trend that is 98% of the society you know, to go offline. I think that is sort of a side trend that is interesting and and good to look at. And then in, in relation to this, we have this whole debate about what is happening with uh, how people feel happy. Right? And this is the happiness index from 2012. It's called the Global Happiness Index. I don't know what the hell that means, but uh, it's complicated, suffice to say. It is calculated by five different pieces, you know, economic happiness, private happiness, uh, 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 level of freedom, and so on and so on. And Norway is number two on this happiness index, right, right before Switzerland. <laughs> and so I wonder why that is, but I think this is really important to look at. It's, uh, so I looked in this a little bit more, and basically what's happening is that lots of research says that basically as we're going away from material thinking in terms of buying material and owning material things, we're switching to what's called the experience society things that make us feel a certain way, and that is becoming sort of the primary reason why we're happy is because we experience something. Right? We have some sort of experience that's not about buying. In fact, 
many people are saying that the process of looking at buying is more satisfying than the buying itself. So, you know, the pleasantness factor, the excitement factor, you know, it's all much higher when you're looking at experiences. And this is very important to think about when you're building, right? Because ultimately, it's about that, right? It's about how you feel about being someplace. So we're moving into this kind of the idea of an experience society. And we went from the uh, information society and before that the industrial society, um, now, and now we're moving into the experience society, which is all about uh, having something that touches you. And this is the most important point for you guys, of course, for your current business side. It's a reinvention of seeing things. I mean, literally reinventing how we can see stuff. And not just by modeling and using stuff like 3D or you know, all these things, but stuff like virtual reality, the Oculus Rift. Have you tried the Oculus Rift? You should. Oculus, O-C-O-L-U-S. Right? Oculus Rift is, was acquired by Facebook. It's a pretty stupid-looking uh, 3D device. But if you wear this thing, it's currently about $350. Right? And Facebook, is, Facebook bought this company because in the future, we're going to go inside the Facebook world, not just inside a web page or a mobile. Right? If you wear this device, you can literally go inside of a world. Right? This is, of course, great for games, but it's also great for stuff like education or doctors or going inside of a human body you know, when you learn things. Right? This will become complete uh, standard default for people to really go inside of information. And, uh, you know, when you can picture this thing, of course, you can take it further and actually wear a bodysuit, which people are using more complicated. The Marriott Hotel has already used those uh, Oculus Rifts to take people to virtual places. So when you check into the Marriott Hotel in Los Angeles, you can go outside into the garden and then you can step into this thing, and then there's a box that, that generates noise and smells. Right? And you can literally travel to Bali. Right? I haven't tried this, but you know, people are saying it's like 95% real. Right? I mean, of course, you're not floating or anything. Yeah. But basically, imagine this for the building process. Right? Wearing this, going inside a building that hasn't been built yet. Right? I mean, this will be a whole different level of... BIM, right? B-I-M, information management. This would be more like experience management. And you can go together with the client in different places. That is going to happen in the next two years. There's already people looking at this. How do you model things? You know, for example, traffic modulations and all kinds of things. And this stuff right now, this device is $300, but you know, in a few years it becomes essentially like having a mobile phone. The question of what we're going to do about this culturally speaking, this could be quite tempting you know, and addictive, of course. You know, the, the entire sex industry is already looking at this, of course. Right? It's a huge thing. Right? I'm not going to go into details here. I have no pictures to show you on this. Right? But the reinvention of how we see things, right? 3D, augmented reality, virtual reality, right? virtual travel. So you should give it some try and you know, experience uh, Check out the Oculus Rift. And Google just invested in this company called Magic Leap. They have a new technology that is based on a 3D projection, so you can touch things and it moves like it was real. So it's essentially using an augmented reality idea that is using a mobile device, right, where you can, you can literally experience something in the palm of your hand or in front of yourself as if it was real. Google invested $850 million dollars in this company, and basically their goal is to reinvent how we see things. So next time you go and browse for a hotel in Bali, you can go inside of it, even without the glasses. I mean, clearly for your business, this would be fantastic to have this kind of tool, and it's coming. I think it'll be just pretty much as common as Skype by 2020. I imagine this being part of the BIM model in the future. So basically what has, what's happening is here that everything is becoming connected. Right? Literally, quite literally everything, and that, that goes for what has been referred to as the Internet of Things. Right? So devices and you know, very powerful things. 
And if you look at this, this is a very scary pyramid right, about all the things that are going to be connected. Right? So tablets, of course, TVs, wearables, connected cars, right? and, and the amount of data that goes up, it's mind-boggling. So in just five years, you'll be able to measure in real time what people's satisfaction with traffic is, how fast they move. You can do that already today. Where, where would they want to live? What is the statistics around that area? What kind of stuff they would like? You will see those kind of systems in place. They're already in place in many locations. For example, farmers are using what's called smart farming for the same concept. Literally connecting every piece of information in cities. I mean, the numbers here are mind-boggling in terms of you know, the growth of this stuff. You know, computer, network equipment, media, of course, household goods, and, and heating, air conditioning, and control systems. Connecting all of those. So this whole business of what's called referred to as green business, essentially, right, it's, it's bound to explode with this. It's a combination of internet technology, ICT, uh, and green business. And, and you can see here the projections of... Uh, of basically the Internet of Things you know, is already at 5 billion roughly uh, by 2015 and 2020 will be like this. So it has big consequences there. And then the concept of you know, what's part of this discussion is about printing buildings. So there's a, a, one, a, a building I went to the other day in Amsterdam called it the uh, Canal House, uh, where right now it's just modeled, but they're building a house printed with 3D printing. You should take a look at it. It's quite interesting. Um, and basically using all kinds of new technologies to measure what it would look like, how people would like to use it, and so on and so on, uh, based on the whole concept of data. And this has been said for 10 years, you know, data is the new oil. Uh, I would be painful for Norway. So. But anyway, that's kind of where we're going with this stuff. And, and um, I will do a survey shortly to see what you think about this. But any, uh, anything that can be digitized will be. This is kind of where we're going with this general uh, uh, trend. You know, if you see, for example, what's happening with luggage now in Amsterdam, you just throw your luggage into the, I call it the luggage hole. You know, you just, there's no more people. You order your food with the iPad, not the waitress. This is now becoming standard procedure in Germany. You open your hotel door with your smartphone. You don't check out your groceries. You just go by the cash register. And because of that automation, anything that cannot be automated, like experiences, embodiments, therapy, food, you know, you have it, becomes more valuable. So I'm actually an interesting way of how that sits together. Right? You know, having an experience, you know, that's kind of hard to replace. Right? What exactly goes on here? So that will increase in the future, but automation is a big factor. Right? So to go with your theme, I think we're looking at an extreme makeover of our society, culture, business, politics. And one of the things that really this does for us is it forces us to get outside of this, right? uh, the silo you know, of being in one business. You know, you're not in one business anymore, you're in five businesses. Communications, media, technology, environment, energy, building, architecture, all comes together. So basically what that means is for most businesses this, right, we, have to, we have to destroy those silos. Because only if you look outside the silo you can see the other things that would matter. And of course there's many other businesses looking at building and construction and architecture as an as uh, extension of what they do. The Chinese company Alibaba has 14 startups looking at the future of architecture. It's just one example of what they're investing in. Then we have this trend of what's called hyper-collaboration. Last year, the United States Post Office and UPS were real bad enemies for 14 years and tried to kill each other, basically. They decided to come together and deliver parcels together. Because only if they did that, they could be satisfactory for the consumer. And ever since then, it's been taken off like a firecracker. They, they run everything now in the US in terms of postal services, small packages, and FedEx, of course, together with a few others like DHL. But basically, the concept of these two guys you know, is, is the concept of hyper-collaboration. And this is the only way to solve larger problems. So you should ask yourself a question. You know, who can you collaborate with 
that can get you much further than by yourself, um, even if it's a really strong competitor of somebody who wants to take your turf. This is kind of the answer for a lot of uh, velocity issues.